started. All right, this webinar is being recorded. Welcome everybody as people start to join us. We are on live on Zoom. Um, we're gonna wait for people to keep logging on here and joining us. I'm seeing we have a couple people that have logged on. We just wanna let you guys know a couple housekeeping things before we get started. And we wait for people that you guys are muted and you won't be able to see each other. You're only gonna be able to see myself and my fellow panelists um, and visitors, Pam and Christiana, and we'll get to know them a little bit better in a minute. Um, you can also, if you wanna access closed captions, you can go on our Facebook, the museum's Facebook and live stream there and select closed captions. And we'll be throwing helpful links in the chat. We'll also have a recording of this, which we are recording right now. Um, and we'll be posting it to our live programs page later for you to access there. But while we wait for people to join us, why don't you guys go ahead and say hi, tell us where you're visiting from. Um, visiting the Zoom from. You can also, we'd also love to know um, if you want to share with us, what do you like about butterflies and moths? As we wait for folks, go ahead and throw that in the chat box. Um, I, I know personally, I love moths and I love their fun little antenna um, that are very like feathery and just cute. Um, how about you, Pam and Christiana? What do you guys like? I'm also a moth lover. And um, one of my favorite groups is the tiger moths because they're super colorful and fluffy sometimes and they're very cute. Yeah, I love both of them, but getting to work with so <laughs> many different types, it's just seeing the diversity of all of them, all the shapes, all the colors, um, you know, different body shapes, different wing shapes, everything. You just see something new every day in the collection. That's so cool. Yeah, there are so many different ones. Oh, and I see here we have um, Los Coaches Creek Middle School joining us. Good morning. Um, and they're saying beautiful colors, which definitely, um, whoops. I'm just telling me you can see my team's messages and I don't know why that is. I'm going to close that. <laughs> and hopefully I'll only have them on my name. Okay, <laughs> so uh we have a couple more participants now so i just want to repeat with you all um that you're muted we can't see you or um your screens or anything like that but we'd love to hear from you in the chat let us know what you like about butterflies and moths um you can also watch us on facebook live right now and we'll have a recording of this we are recording we'll have it on our live programs page later but feel free to say hi drop in the chat what you what you like about butterflies and moths um anything else i'm seeing from people here okay Ooh, vibrant green colors i'm seeing from danielle hmm yeah there are a lot with vibrant green, green colors huh? a lot somebody else is saying they're beautiful egan saying they're beautiful they are beautiful and i have to say um <laughs> oh, I like their colors. Somebody's saying, what are butterflies good for? Which is really Nothing. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you might wonder, what are they good for? Do they do anything? And they do, right? They pollinate flowers. They're food for other animals as well. Which is really important. Very important pollinator for sure. Mm -hmm. I see somebody, Juliana, saying neon blue and green. Somebody, Lyndon, saying they're in danger, which they are. We're going to talk about certain butterflies are in danger um, right now. And I love the variety of wing patterns. Ooh, the design in their wings. No one's mentioning some of the clear wing moths. Those are usually a hit. They're are so they? neat. Yeah. And the one with the little pink in the corners of the hind wings. Ooh. So pretty. Um, and personally, I just, I am a big fan of moths. I love moths. I'm all about moths, but um, butterflies are okay too. Oh, somebody's saying they look like camo. I love the clear. Somebody's agreeing with you. They love the clear. Green and yellow moths, awesome. So I'm so glad to hear that you guys are, um, but yeah, you don't have to know what their names are. Don't worry, we're gonna talk about some today. You, you don't have to know what their names are to appreciate them. Like we have all these beautiful pictures up here on the screen that we're sharing. Um, with all these cool colors. So you can just enjoy looking at them. You don't need to know their names. So let's go ahead and get 
started then because there's so much fun in the chat. I'm glad to see all this moth and butterfly love and we're going to get to know a little bit more about them as we go. Feel free to add qu ask questions in the chat as we go and we're going to keep um, addressing those as we go through and sometimes we might wait till the very end. So don't worry if we don't answer your question right away. We're also going to have time at the end for questions. Um, so as we said before, we're recording this just so you all know and you won't be able to see each other and you're muted. Um, and I just want to say hi to Pam and Christiana. Pam and Christiana work with me at the museum. My name's Lauren. Um, I work at the NAT as well. I work in the education department and Pam and Christiana work in our entomology department. So they're, they're there with the, the insects, which butterflies and moths are part of them. Um, and Pam is the collection manager and Christiana is the um, program manager or projects manager, I'm sorry. And we're going to learn a little bit more about what that means um, as they talk to us today and get started and introduce themselves. So we've talked a lot about entomology. Um, and so Pam, I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit more about kind of like what that word is. I will try. So as Lauren mentioned, uh, butterflies and moths are in the group of called insects. Um, and the study of insects is called entomology. So insects are by far the most diverse group of plants and animals. And there's over a million different species described so far. Um, the group with the most species is beetles. So um, you can see some in this tray here. Um, and so, or if you think of the stink beetles that you see around very often, um, they're the most diverse group. Um, estimates on the number of species of insects historically have kind of ranged from about one and a half million to over 30 million species, which is crazy. Uh, um, but entomologists have settled on sort of an idea that there's about 10 million uh, insect species with, so there's tons to be discovered still. That's a lot. Next slide, yeah. <laughs> So the focus of today's webinar is just one group of insects, and that's the Lepidoptera, and, or butterflies and moths, clearly. So the name Lepidoptera comes from two Greek words, um, the first being Lepidos, or scaly, and the, se the second word being pteron, which is wing. So when you combine them, um, you get scaly wings, which makes a lot of sense because um, scaly wings is a defining character of all butterflies and moths. That's pretty cool. I don't think a lot of people realize that unless you really have gotten to see them like super up close, but they're actually scaly. And so all insects are actually made up of three body parts. Um, there's the head and then the middle part is the thorax and then the end part is the abdomen. They all have six legs or in three pairs and they have an exoskeleton or hard outer body covering kind of like if our bones were on the outside of us. Um, butterflies and moths have a special mouth part um, called a proboscis, which is, you can see on the photo there, it's kind of coiled up like a long straw, and they use that to drink nectar from the flowers when they visit them. And that's also kind of when they're pollinating flowers too, right? Yeah. They're going yeah. on, so very cool. Often their bodies kind of rub up against them and help pollinate too. Nice. So, yeah. Just get it all over. <laughs> So another neat thing about um, Lepidoptera is their life cycle. And uh, you can see here using the monarch as an example, there are four stages. So there's an egg, the larva, a pupa, and then the adult phase. Um, and for butterflies and moths, the larval stage when they're babies is called a caterpillar, which I'm sure many of you know um, and have seen. And then the next stage is when they sort of curl up in a ball and get in this little casing and turn their body into goo. And inside this cocoon or chrysalis, um, the goo totally reorganizes itself in, from a caterpillar to an adult butterfly or moth, which is pretty crazy. And this whole process is called complete metamorphosis. It's amazing that they just <laughs> turn into goo. I love that. Goo. Is that yeah. the scientific term? Goo. <laughs> So um, all species are given a scientific name when they're first described. And for the monarch, it's Danius plexippus. Um, as you may know, monarchs depend on native milkweed to complete their life cycle, um, which we just finished discussing. And sometimes you can tell the difference between a male and a female monarch, um, but uh, sorry, sometimes it's different. It's it, difficult to tell the difference between males and females, but for monarchs, 
it's actually really, really easy. So you can see in this uh, picture that males have that black spot on their hind wing, on the wing, on the vein. So it's pretty simple if you see them out, out flying around to tell the difference between males and females. So you're going to look for a little black spot on that back wing there. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't even know until I started working at the museum that like there was a difference between male and female monarchs so, or other like butterflies too, yes, right? Right. So a lot of other butterflies um, display sexual dimorphism. So they might be totally different colors between males and females, which is super confusing when you see them out flying. Right. And then for other insects, it's often you have to look at their... Um, they're different body parts and tell them tell them apart that way to see yeah. if they're male or female and use I would imagine like a microscope for such absolutely certain, yeah you really gotta yeah. get in there yeah wow. <laughs> That's amazing um so another really interesting association with monarchs is that of another butterfly um called the viceroy and they look really similar right Mm -hmm. um, one is actually mimicking the other in a type of mimicry called Mullerian mimicry, where both species are just equally as noxious and distasteful, um, and mimicking each other helps them um, uh, evade predators, basically. So, um, so when you, you say like noxious and distasteful, we, I know we had a question, are monarchs poisonous? Is that something that they, are they just taste bad? They just taste bad. Okay. They may they may um, cause the predator to like spit it out, right? Because they yeah. taste bad. But I don't know if they actually make them sick. I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. So, um, can you tell the difference between them? There's you know a clear white circle showing the difference. Um, but the easiest way to tell apart a monarch from a viceroy is that black vein that's crossing the hind wing. If you can look at both of them, you see there's like that black line crossing. Yeah, so right there. It's a really easy way to tell them apart. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So I know that you've put together like a little game for us that we're going to play with the polls and Emma's going to help us with that. She's going to do um, our polls here, but we're going to look at pictures and try and figure out if it's a monarch or a viceroy. And we can do this together because I know it can be really hard. Um, I have a lot of trouble, monarch or viceroy. So if you guys are ready, let's go ahead and let's look at this picture. There's a butterfly here. Let's see if you guys can guess, is it a monarch or a viceroy? Emma opened the poll so you can answer there. I see a couple of people, a lot of people are saying viceroy, a lot of people are saying monarch. We wanna look and see, remember there's that front wing and the back wing. If there's a black line across that back wing, viceroy, right? That's what, yes, okay. <laughs> you got so, it <laughs> we're testing okay so i think we've got we're pretty close more people are saying viceroy some people are saying monarch um so i think that we can end our poll and let's see let's which see. one is it oh, pretty good it is a viceroy and that's what most it people is. thought okay so it does have that that line across the wing, right? It does, yeah. Okay, okay, let's try again. So we've got another another little poll there for us to try again, their next one. So is this one a monarch or a viceroy? What do you guys think? And I know this seems hard because we literally just learned it. So don't, no pressure, but we're looking for a black line, right? If we see a black line across the, the back wing, I see most people are saying monarch. A couple of people are thinking maybe it's a viceroy. Okay. You might have to move the pole box aside oh, too, right? Is it, it blocking Covering people? the image. Mm, okay. Mm. Yeah. You, might have to like <laughs> you can just kind of see the corner of the wing on my screen. Oh, okay. Well, that's makes it hard. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go ahead and end the poll. Most people were thinking it was a monarch. Let's see which one was it. Good job. You're right. Monarch. <laughs> Yay. Okay. And one now more. we have our third one. This one's one more a bit time. tricky. Just warning you. Let's see. Oh yeah, that is tricky. It's like a side view. Okay. So I'm going to look for its head to be able to tell which is the front wing. The front wing is going to be closer to the head. The back wing is going to be further away. And I see antenna in front. 
So I think this is the head and I see like, a, I do see a line across the back wing. Ah, what do you guys think? I see some people saying Monarch, some people saying Viceroy. Let's wait another couple seconds. Do, 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 Monarch or Viceroy. Okay, let's end the poll and ooh, see here. Whoa, Viceroy. Wow, that was a tough yeah. one. Yeah. That was a tricky one. Just um, throwing you guys off. Yeah, well, that was fun. Okay, so now I feel a little bit like a bit of a monarch viceroy expert. And our um, monarchs and viceroys, are there something that we would see in San Diego? So not really. So you're pretty safe. If you see an orange, a larger orange butterfly flying around, it's most likely going to be a monarch. Um, the viceroys are actually just east of the Sierra Nevadas. So they, okay. they can come over here, but it's a pretty rare event. Okay, so we're usually in San Diego, Southern California, we're seeing monarchs when we see this yeah. type of a, okay, that's good to know. So otherwise I would have been real worried. <laughs> oh, okay, so now we kind of looked at two different types, two different species of butterfly, um, but moths and butterflies, so two different types of Lepidoptera, how do we tell the difference between the two of those? Because I know that that's always a tricky kind of thing. Yeah, it's a really common question that comes up, um, how to tell the difference. So like Lauren said, they're both in the order Lepidoptera, um, but there are some key differences you can learn to tell them apart. So I'll talk about a couple of the main differences that you can easily distinguish without a microscope and whatnot. So okay. you can go to the first one. And the, the easiest way to tell the difference between a butterfly and a moth is by their behavior. So when they're out flying around, um, butterflies are usually found during the day and moths are usually found at night. So um, there's always exceptions to this, but this is a pretty hard fast rule. So if you see something out flying during the day, you're probably looking at a butterfly. Okay. Yeah. So most of the stuff we're seeing around like our porch lights or lights at night are probably moths. Exactly. Yep. And so another easy way to tell them apart is actually um, how they fold their wings or hold them at rest. And so butterflies can't really fold their wings and they hold them over their back in sort of a tent-like position. Um, while moths, when at rest, they, they actually have the ability to fold their wings. So they kind of like slide them over one another like this over their backs. So you can okay. see between the photos, a little bit of a difference, right? The butterfly has its wings up over its body um, and then the moths fold them flat over their body. So, so the butterflies are on the left. Um, on the left. Painted yeah. lady butterfly. Yeah. That's okay. right. And then a variety of moths that I collected off of a sheet this summer. <laughs> Ooh, that's pretty fun. I have yeah. heard, I've never gotten to do that, but I hear that's how entomologists go mothing if they set up a sheet and put a light on it. Absolutely. Yeah, black light. So, mm -hmm. ah. very simple way. So anybody could kind of do that at home if you had a black light and a sheet. If you had a black light, yep. That's the tricky cool. part, but <laughs> Very you can cool. find them online. Um, and then, so like I mentioned, there's always exceptions to the rule. And so this one's a really big exception and it's a whole family, a whole group of butterflies called the skipper butterflies or Hesperiidae. Um, and they actually have the ability to fold their wings. So if you do okay. see something flying during the day, and its wings are folded over its back and it's brown or orange, most likely, it's probably within this family of butterflies. So, okay. yep. And these little guys are out during the day kind of fluttering about. They're pretty little, right? They're like- the, Yeah, they're like an inch tops. Okay. Yeah, they're pretty small. And I see somebody asking um, like how big are monarch butterflies? What? And they're pretty like, they're pretty large for like, like you're going to notice it if it's flying by, right? Yeah, inches? like a couple inches, three inches or so wingspan. Yeah, yeah. so they're yeah, pretty good they're pretty size. Big. Okay, let's go to the next. Um, fine, okay. Okay, so this is also a really easy way to tell butterflies and moths apart and that's their antennae. So off of their head, they have these cute little antennae um, and the two different types. So butterflies on the right have this club or ball on the end of their antennae, um, while moths, the two pictures on the left, um, have either straight, and the scientific name for that is actually called filiform, 
um, or feathery or comb-like um, antennae. And okay. those are called pectinate antennae. So depending on whether it's a male or a female moth, um, you can see the difference between them. So males have those comb-like, feathery-like antennae that they use to detect females um, around them. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So they have so that. It's a sensory, it's a sensory okay. thing. Yeah. Very cool. I thought they were just really wanted to be pretty because they are so pretty. <laughs> they are very cute. cute. And I know somebody was saying in the chat too, that moths are fuzzy. They are fuzzy. It hel actually yeah. kel helps keep them warm at night, right? Because they're out flying when it's cold and they have extra scales to keep them warmer. Oh my gosh. I didn't know that. That's so yeah. cute. Like a sweater. A moth yeah. sweater. Like Exactly. So in the last way to tell moths and butterflies apart um, that I'm going to talk about today is, um, like I mentioned earlier, that that pupil phase where they turn to goo, there's a difference between um, moths and butterflies. So on the left is a pipe fine swallowtail, and you can see the pupa hangs from a branch, and it's a hard exoskeleton, kind of like a hard chitinous case. And that is called the chrysalis. So whenever you have a butterfly in that pupil phase, it's a chrysalis, it's a specific term for butterflies. And then a cocoon is actually spun with silk and moths spin a silk cocoon for their pupil phase. But other insects also use silk and spin cocoons as well. So it's not just oh. for moths. Okay. But chrysalis I just butterflies. Chrysalis is, okay. Oh, yeah. wow. So that's totally unique to butterflies as a chrysalis. Yeah. That is very cool. Yeah. So those are some of the easiest ways to tell moths and butterflies apart from one another. Okay. So it's very yeah. helpful. So you want to look, see when they're out, look at their antenna. Absolutely. How they're holding their wings. And how they're holding their wings. And then if you see a cocoon or a chrysalis. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, so now that we've answered a couple of your burning questions regarding biology of butterflies and moths, um, I'd like to bring you in for a brief tour of our entomology collection and show you how we store all of these, these things. And I do, I just want to interrupt really quick, Pam, as I yeah. noticed that in the chat, there's kind of like some spamming going off. And so we're going to have to turn off the chat if um, we can't focus, because uh, I know it's kind of hard to focus when there's spamming going on. So we might have to stop the chat, which is a bummer, because then people can't ask their questions. Yeah. Um, so please stop spamming the chat. Otherwise, we're going to have to turn it off. And we don't want to do that, because we want to hear from you guys. And I will say, um, Pam, a couple questions that popped up, and maybe that's something we're going to have to look up, because um, I have no idea. It's very specific, but monarchs okay. and viceroys, somebody's asking kind of like how long of a lifespan do butterflies and moths have? How long of a lifespan do monarchs have? Um, so I don't know if there's any sort of, because there's so many different ones, any sort of general rule or pattern out there? Yeah. So in general, I think you would say a week or two is the oh, general wow. lifespan in the wild. So in captivity, they can last a little longer sometimes. Um, if you're taking really good care of them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, usually a week or two is the lifespan. So, but it totally depends on the species. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's like general, but then there are specific ones that like have a totally different, they can live longer or even shorter, I imagine. Yeah. Right? Yep. Okay. Some burst out and are only in the world for a day. <laughs> so, oh, wow. So you yeah. really have to make it count. Yep. So now, okay, so so we're going to see where you and Christiana work, the entomology collection exactly. at the museum. So behind the scenes at the museum, if anybody has gone to the museum, this is actually on the third floor. There are doors up there. You may not even notice them, but if you actually go behind them, there are all these researchers, scientists working, and they are here doing really cool stuff. And we're going to learn a little bit about that. So yeah. So when you first walk into the collection room, you just see this bank of teal cabinets, basically. Um, and they roll on the floor and have cabinets on, on them um, that securely store um, insects. And all of our collections here are housed in similar types of compactor systems. So then if you open um, one of these white doors, you can see that there's a ton of drawers inside of them. Um, and each of these, it sort of behaves like a library of insects. Each drawer is labeled with what you can find inside of it. So you can see the drawers pulled out there. There's lots of butterflies. And then yeah. when you pull each drawer out, you can see that um, 
there's all of these little white boxes, which you call unit trays. And each of these generally holds um, a different species of Lepidoptera. Um, and as you can see in the upper left corner of the tray, um, the single tray, um, this is a, there's a little gray label telling you exactly which species it is. And in this case, it's uh -huh. Memoria pulcherima. Yeah. Um, and it's a lovely green moth in the family. Thank you for circling that. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's within the family Geometridae, um, which the other name for that group is the inchworms because their caterpillars are those little ones that inch forward. Um, and so we have a number of specimens um, uh, of, of certain species and it can take up more than one unit tray sometimes. Sometimes it can take up more like all more than a drawer um, but in this case, there's a couple different species and each box sort of indicates that. Um, so, so now cool. that we know a little bit more about butterflies and moths and how we store them in our collection, um, Christiana is actually going to speak a little bit about the next steps we take in order to get the data from each of these specimens um, out and accessible to everyone. And she'll specifically tell us about our LepNet digitization project as an example of this. Very cool. And I love seeing all of these. These are moths, right? Together. Mm -hmm. And they're like these beautiful green moths. And you were saying these are from San Diego, right? They you are find from them San here. Diego. Yeah. So cool. I would have, I had no idea until you said that. All right. These ones are tricky because they look a little bit like butterflies. Yeah, they yeah. do. They really they're do. Super and especially delicate. like the colors too. I think it's easy to like think moths don't have a lot of colors, but a lot of them kind of do, right? Yeah. Yeah, you really can look pretty. at their little antennae. Let's see. Yeah, we need our microscope. <laughs> Can't really, yeah. <laughs> All right. So, Christiana, thank you so much, Pam. Yeah, you're welcome. Yes, thanks, Pam. I'm really excited to talk to you all today. As they mentioned, my name is Christiana, and I am the project coordinator here at the museum. And one of my most exciting projects is LEPNET, which is very appropriate for today because LEPNET is a project all about documenting and sharing our Lepidoptera collection. And our Lepidoptera collection is special because we actually have a regional focus at our museum. So that means that our museum is focused on um, collecting things from Baja California and Southern California. So if someone has a, a specimen from that area, we are sort of the hub for that. So we have a really unique contribution to make um, before this project, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about. We didn't have any access to anyone other than people at the collection to our specimens in the collection. But by digitizing this collection, which I'll explain what that is more, we're able to share our collection to people all over the world. Um, so we get to collaborate with people to help care and conserve for our butterflies um, that we wouldn't be able to do without LeftNet. So the process to getting this information out there and sharing is called digitization. So I'll talk about that now because I know that that is a, a big word, um, but it's really a simple concept. So digitization is taking something physical and putting it into a digital form. So for us, what's physical is the specimens themselves. So we have specimens in the unit trays, like Pam said, and with every specimen, it's on a pin and beneath the pin is um, a group of labels and the labels will say information about how the specimen, um, where the specimen was collected, maybe how the specimen was collected, when it was collected, and then you know what the specimen is. So we get for each specimen uh, a whole string of information about it. Um, and when it's physical, only people who can come and physically see the collection will be able to see the information on the labels. So when we digitize, we're actually moving all of that information onto a database that will go on the internet. So then people who are all over the world can go and see the information for each of our specimens. So we like to talk uh, about this process as being something that sort of unlocks our collection to the world. So right now I'm in the collection and so I have access to the specimens, but unless you're here with me right now, uh, you wouldn't. But with LepNet, when we digitize, we're going to unlock that so that anyone uh, who has internet access, wherever they are, can come and explore our collection in a way. So the digitization cool. process occurs in two parts. Um, the first part is an imaging process. So when we image a specimen, you'll see here the steps. 
we're going to move that physical, um, that physical collection into a digital form in the form of an image first. So and we Christiana, remove, sorry yeah. to interrupt you. I was gonna say one thing, because I, I forget this because I'm older, but certain people that have just grown up with the internet, like the internet didn't exist when I was born. So it's it's easy to forget that like other things existed, right? So we have all these physical collections that aren't online, right? They aren't on the internet and we actually have to put them there. So that's what this is doing. This is putting them on the internet. So we have like all this information that has yet to even be put on the internet. So when you think everything out there is on the internet, that's not true. There's all sorts of information that's not out there yet. So that's what Christiana is doing here with LEPNET, which is really cool. That's right, Lauren. So before this process, um, none of this was on the internet. So this process is bringing it on there. So as you can see in the left-hand picture, we have a stage that we sort of do a photo shoot for each specimen in, uh, where the labels, which contain the information about the specimen, are taken off, as well as um, the scientific name is put on the, the image so that we know what it is. Um, we have a person that's imaging, and then it goes into um, a standardized image where you'll see here, this specimen has uh, a ruler so we can see how big it is. We have the specimen so you can take a look at what the specimen looks like. We have its scientific name. We have all of the labels that were on it which give us all the information about the specimen. And then we also have a funny little label which looks like a barcode. And that's because it is a barcode. So. Uh, for each specimen, when we image it, we also assign it a catalog number. And all that means is it's getting a barcode that's unique to that specimen. So like a product in the store has a barcode and you scan it and you get information about its price and all of those things, our specimens also get a barcode so that if someone were to scan that, they would also be able to pull up all the information. So that's the first part is imaging. And then there's one more step. Okay. And all that information we're going to see in this next slide here is kind of like where it's found and stuff like that. The date? Cool. Absolutely. So part two of digitization is transcription of that data. So transcription is just a funny word for um, typing it out. So the text that's in the image we now need to type out into this form that you see here. So we have a group of virtual volunteers, so people all over the country that uh, log into our database. And then as you can see in the next slide, they take the information that is associated with that specimen. So the information on the date you can see is in pink highlighted, and then you'll see someone has typed that out into our form in pink, and so on for the locality. All the information that's with that specimen now gets put in a form. And the good thing about it being in a form is then it's online and it's searchable. So we can really look for specific things. If you wanted to find something of just one species, you could search in our database and find just that or from a certain date. So you can answer a lot of questions and having this information digitized makes that a lot easier. So that's the second piece of transcription. And that's the last piece, but you might have the next question, which we'll see. Um, oh, first, actually, uh, you might wonder how many we've done, because that's a huge question we get is how, how many specimens have we done? And a lot. So we have 68,000 records uh, right now. We have over 42,000 images. That accounts for over 3,000 species. And those numbers keep going up. So we are still doing this project. We still have people taking pictures. Uh, we still have people databasing. So this project is um, continuous and ongoing. So uh, these numbers are just actually our starting point of this. And uh, every day, every day we're adding more to our knowledge into this database. So wow. this so huge that's, database. <laughs> I was going to say, that's a lot. Yeah. How many... Um... How many butterflies and moths do you guys have in the collection at the museum in general? That's a good question. So when you have so many specimens like we do, it's hard to get an exact count. So counting one by one is really difficult. So sometimes we have to make an estimate. And so we make um, an informed estimate and then see from there um, how close we're getting to with that when we go through our project. So our initial estimate was around 150,000. So we've just kind of 
we're really just beginning. If we have 150,000 specimens, we still have so much more that we can still contribute with this project. Yeah. Um, but at the end of this project, we might end up finding that we have, you know, a little bit less than that, maybe a little bit more even. Um, but this project also lets us explore our collection and answer some of those questions too, since we are getting to interact with um, all of the specimens uh, in a way that we normally don't get to. So cool. And I noticed somebody in the chat was saying like, oh, I only thought moths were gray and black. And this picture here in the bottom right, those are all moths, right? Yes. They're those huge. are all moths. They're huge. They're beautiful. They have eye spots and, yeah. and everything. So moths aren't just tiny little brown things. They, they come in all sorts of colors, all sorts of shapes, um, all sorts of sizes. So um, yeah, it's really, it's really a diverse group for sure. And some and those of those moths are, are actually found here. So you can actually wow. find some of those really large moths, the Saturnids, um, around San Diego. That's what I was going <laughs> to ask. I was like, I've never yeah. seen one here, but they're, they're here. Yep. Wow. That's so cool. It's amazing. Yes. So this is the question that I, I'm guessing you might ask. Uh, with all of these specimens out there and all of them digitized, you might wonder who can use them or where are they going to go? And so the answer is we do it for everyone, really. So institutions of learning can go and view them. So research institutions, um, you know, other museums, researchers themselves, they might be interested in a question. Instead of coming here, they can use our data online, but it's actually also available to you. So there is a, an international database called GBIF, and that will be included in the chat so you guys can go check it out. But GBIF is um, an international database, which our collection feeds into. So anyone with internet access can go and search in uh, our collection in GBIF and just a world of collections in GBIF, and you will find every specimen that we have databased in there. So you can also use this. That's so cool. And I noticed somebody had a question about like, what is the average wingspan of a monarch? And so that's something that you could use this information for, right? You could look at all those rulers of, of monarchs and put in, you know, like this one's four inches, this one's three inches, and then calculate that and find the average. And you could, you could figure that out yourself if you wanted to, if you had the time to go through all of those. Luckily, somebody's already done it for us, right? Scientists have already done at least that question for us. But if you had your own burning questions, you could poke around in here and possibly answer them, Absolutely. which is really cool. And so I think that's sort of what the, the last slide for my piece is going to talk about, um, which is how do we use this digitized data? Um, and that's a great question because a lot of people ask, you know, you guys have so many of the same thing. Why do you need all of that? Um, and that's a very good question. We digitize it all. And uh, the reason we have so many and we want to digitize all this information is a collection of, you know, from through time, a collection across, you know, all, all variations of the species lets us answer scientific questions. So the first bit about seeing species variation, if you think about within humans, you couldn't just take two or three humans and know, you know, a good idea about what humans look like because we all have, you know, different, different ways that we look. So by having a collection with lots of the same species, we get to see the variation within that species and see how that differs so we can really know what that species looks like. We can also study change over time. So we have collections that range from the early 1900s to today. We can see is something different from way back when to now. Um, and both of these things help us answer conservation questions, which is our, our big goal with keeping these collections is to care and conserve for these uh, specimens and these species uh, through time. So. By being able to see maybe is something more abundant uh, today or more abundant in the past? Uh, is it changing where it's living? Um, these can help us answer questions so that we can better conserve them. And you'll see in this photo is an example. This is called the Kino Checker Spot. This is very special to us here because the Kino Checker Spot is local and it is also protected. So it's something that we're very interested um, in knowing more about. And so by having a large collection of Kino checker spots, we can see and answer some of these questions about, is it habitat changing? Um, is it, you know, is its abundance changing? Things like that. 
um, as well as training people. Uh, if they can see the variation between a species, we can train people with our set to be able to identify these. So when they do surveys to see and answer these questions, they're better able to do that. So this is just one example uh, of how we use this data and having it accessible means that anyone with any question they have can come peek around with the information we have um, to answer some of those questions. But I know Lauren is gonna talk a little bit more about maybe how you can do that too. Yeah, that's, um, that's so cool. So all of our collections are kind of telling us where things are found and when they're found. And like you were saying, we could see if that changes. Um, and you know, researchers and volunteers have, have, have done that, but now also um, everybody out there can also help. Um, there's something I know a lot of people even brought this up earlier about um, monarchs. They've been in the news and their numbers are, are decreasing. We think they're decreasing and it's kind of like, well, how do we know that? Um, because of things like museum collections, we know that we used to have this many probably in an area and now we have less or they're not found in an area they used to be. Um, and you can help with that over the last, more, for more than 20 years, people have been volunteering with the Western Monarch Thanksgiving count. And they go out and they count all the monarchs they see in California. We have monarchs that visit us um, during the winter. They come here for the warmer weather and um, they call that overwintering here. And we used to have these huge numbers of them. Um, people would go out and count them um, and share that information. And steadily that those numbers have been declining. So you'll see in this slide, we'd had millions and millions, uh, over a million in the late nineties. And then now in the last couple of years, we just have like 29,000 were found a little over 29,000. So that's quite a, a dip down. And because of people like you going out, counting them, sharing that with scientists, sharing that with, um, the Xerxes Society is a place that helps monarchs and also California um, Fish and Wildlife. We share that information and then we know how many are out there and how they're doing. If they're doing better, if they're not, you'll see some years they do better, some years they don't, but it just helps us keep an eye on them and then know if we need to help them. If we need to preserve areas where they're found um, so they can keep coming back and visiting and, and living. So we still have monarchs because otherwise we might lose them, which would not be good because um, they're very important. Uh, and so, We'll be putting in the chat, there's a place where you can get involved, take pictures if you guys see monarchs anytime now during the winter. So starting now through like the new year and winter, um, you, if you see a picture, if you see a monarch, you can take a picture and you can upload it um, to this website here and you'll see how to learn about um, monarchs and milkmead, which is really cool. Um, and that brings us to question time. We have a couple of minutes for questions. We're almost done because that was really almost out of time, full of information. I know we already answered a lot of questions. If there are any more burning questions, I know I saw some about um, why do monarchs and just in general butterflies and moths, why do they have like patterning on them? Why are they the colors they are? I know that that could be a really varied answer, but do you guys have any sort of like general answer for that, Pam? Yeah, there's a few different reasons. So um, they can use colors to communicate with one another for butterflies during the day, you know, um, and then also to warn others like the monarch with its orange or red or yellow are generally warning colors. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't see colors too often on moths because they're at night and they don't communicate that way. Oh, um, okay. That makes yeah. sense. So, and then they can also use it for camouflage. You know, there's lots of butterflies and moths that um, look very much like trees or leaves or something like that. So they can use colors to blend in with their surroundings. We saw, I think in that first like picture was there's was one that looked like a, like a dead leaf. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's so cool. So that's a couple reasons. And somebody say asking if butterflies pollinate, which they do, right? Like Absolutely. what? Do, and moths so do, do as moths. well, right? Yeah, yeah. so do moths. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. They, they get a bad rap just because we're asleep doesn't mean everything else is, right? So there's exactly flowers that are open at night that we might not even know about. Yeah. And then I hear there's one here too. Like how many butter? What's the biggest moth? What's the biggest butterfly? What's the smallest moth? What's the smallest butterfly? Which I know. Yeah, so actually the largest moth is called the atlas moth, and it was actually in that first photo, I think. It's really like ah. orange and brown 
maybe it's not the first it's on the difference between butterflies and moths okay i'll see if i can um that slide it has it so there that very center one is an atlas moth ah wow so that's the largest moth and then the largest butterfly is actually a birdwing butterfly found in papua new guinea um the ones that look kind of like the wings are really long and that's on the the first slide there that sort of green and black one is a is a species of bird wing butterfly oh how cool okay, yeah I'll to go back and then it, and then we are we're at our time unfortunately because that was so cool um oh that so one, this green, green and black the green one. and yellow wow. yeah mm -hmm. how beautiful so, but that's not that's not specifically the largest one but there are ones that are even bigger yeah. than that i think it's like an atlas moth can get up to 30 centimeters wingspan, which is a ruler. So that's wow. huge. Yeah. Yeah. It's like 12 inches. What? Um. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So one Any last question. Questions? I know we're yeah. almost at, somebody was just saying, where do they live? Like, where do mother butterflies and moths live? And I don't know if they mean geographically like just in the world where are they found or like habitat wise where they live it seems like they're found mm -hmm. everywhere um in the world except antarctica okay um and then uh where they live is all over the place um they kind of can hide anywhere at night they will find any nook and cranny to hide but um any habitat really wow that's so, pretty cool so they're yeah. all over the place they're really really important then they're doing a yep. lot Absolutely. Well, thank you guys so much. Thanks, Pam and Christiana. That was really wonderful. That was so much great information. Um, and we will be um, back next month too with our partners, Climate Science Alliance. Uh, so join us then. The information will be on our live programs page for how to RSVP. We'll be talking about climate change um, and sea level rise. And um, there's also a fun citizen science project. You can get involved with that. So thanks so much for joining us, everybody. Um, I hope we answered some of your burning butterfly and moth questions. There was a lot, there are a lot, because I think everybody has some really great questions out there. So thanks for sharing them with us and thanks for sharing your brains, Christiana and Pam. That was, that was Thank wonderful. You. Thanks so much. And thanks Emma Thank and Haley you. for helping us on the back. So have a great afternoon, everybody, and a great weekend and take care. Thanks. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye.